Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. We've been looking at the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Uh, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Today we're going to talk about the idea of peace. Those who are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, This is a very intentional idea. It's a very active verb. I saw this picture this week about these uh, soldiers. One is from the Confederate Army, one is from the Union Army, and these are veterans, and they're shaking hands at Gettysburg over this wall, making peace with each other. Now, there is so much history and all that, there is so much turmoil and war and all that, but these two older veterans, and I don't know when this picture was taken, obviously it's old, but they shook hands over this wall saying, let there be peace among us. We're going to talk about peace today. We're going to look at what that is. I think in our goal and as uh, as a pastor, it's my goal that we have peace in our families and not have conflict in our families. Some people would say, well, you're just an idealist. You're, that's a dream that not everybody can have peace in their home. You know what I mean? There's a lot of conflict. There's a lot of difficult stuff. Maybe you have psycho living in your house and they're constantly, you know, barking at you or telling you you're wrong or you're always telling people they're wrong or whatever. My son was in a play this past fall and uh, it was the Adams Family play and he got to play Pugsley. If you know the story of Adams Family, Pugsley has a sister Wednesday and Wednesday is, she falls in love with this boy and uh, Pugsley and Wednesday have this relationship together and you would call it torture actually. Cade, my son, sang this song as Pugsley on stage about uh, the fact that his sister tortures her and that she, you know, does all this stuff to him and the funny thing about that relationship is it's based on pain. It's based on how much can you hurt me and she has him hooked up on this electric chair and she would push this button or push a lever and he'd get shocked and he'd go, oh, do it again, do it again and it was all based on this weird psychotic, like, I would say not peaceful relationship. What's funny is that we though in our families and in our desire we strive for peace, right? But we don't want to strive for fake peace. I'm going to talk about what real peace is and what fake peace is. I think it's easy in families to get caught up in the conflict. The in-laws that try to parent your kids and uh, the difficulty that that can be, um, the hard stuff that goes on when your kids are fighting in, their ho- in your house or when the kids are yelling at the parents, I hate you. You always are too rough, with, you're too strict with me. You're too, you, know, you hear about these families. I've got friends that work in social services and the stories that I hear about people that go through such difficult times and broken families and remarriages and people that have to have blended families and children and you're taking care of one that's not your own and there's just a lot of difficulty and conflict. So how do we come to a passage like Matthew 5 that says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. How do we become a peacemaker? I don't think peace is just the absence of trouble or the absence of conflict. Because if you really read the words that Jesus said, he went after things. And if we're to be like Christ in our behavior, if we're to act like Jesus, we need to go after some of the difficult things. You know, Jesus, he was talking to this crowd on this hill in the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, and this whole crowd gathers together. And he says, you've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You remember that? 
And Jesus said, in the law, in the, Old, in the Old Testament and in Leviticus, there's this law, you can take out somebody if they take out one of yours. Anything you watch on film is all about retaliation and trying to get somebody back for something they did to you, right? But Jesus flips it and he says, it's not just an eye for an eye. Actually, I want you to turn the other cheek. I want you to give your coat away to somebody who wants your coat. And then he tells a story. If somebody asks you to walk a mile, walk with them two miles. That was a Roman guard story. When a Roman guard would say, here, carry my stuff to a Jewish person, the Jewish person would have to walk at least a mile under the law. And if they didn't walk that mile, they could be thrown in prison, they could be persecuted and what have you. But Jesus says, if a Roman guard asks you to walk a mile, walk with him two miles. Show him that he's not in control of you. It's a pretty amazing thought. So we get to this idea of peace. What does peace actually mean? Where does it come from? There's a Greek word for peace called irene. Um, and what it means, it's just peace. It, it means peacefulness, peace of heart, which actually comes from the Hebrew Old Testament, which is the word shalom. If you heard the word shalom before, shalom is not just a peaceful, easy feeling. I've got peace like a river, a flowing mountain river down. You know, it's not just peaceful feelings. Shalom is this idea of God making all things right and good in his time. God is a God of justice. He's a God of mercy, a God of compassion. He makes the wrong things right. Would you say that we have a lack of shalom in our world where it looks as though God is asleep. It looks as though God is not acting in peace and trying to solve the world's problems. I don't know if you watch the news, but we're going to talk about the 21 Christians who were beheaded this past week in Egypt, in Libya, and the whole idea of that. What does it actually mean? And as Christians, we want to go after people and get justice and we should just drop more bombs. We should actually pick up swords. We should, right? Jesus says, no, 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 no. You should be peacemakers. It's an entire biblical theme. It's not just something new for our century. It's a whole theme of shalom and peacemaking, making the wrong right, which takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. Here's the thing. We tend to think as Christians that we have the right to act. I have the right to respond the way I do. I have the right to, when I'm offended, to act a certain way. These are my rights. The problem is when I own my rights, when I am looking at, out for my rights, I'm looking out for myself. I'm not looking out for the peace of other people. So I've got a couple things you can write in your notes. We need to strive to be peacemakers and not just peacekeepers. There's a radical difference between being a peacemaker, making things right, or a peacekeeper, just keeping things right. I have a set of handcuffs in my office, and therefore a sermon illustrations in that. I didn't happen to go grab them. I got them at Knott's Berry Farm when I was like 15 years old in California. I bought them. They're these little trick handcuffs, you know what I mean? And they actually work. Uh, three years ago when I first started preaching here for our church, I grabbed a kid, Larry, I think he was 14, and I brought him up on stage, and I was talking about Paul, and I was talking about sin, and how sin holds us captive to the things of the enemy, and I handcuffed myself like this, and then I handcuffed Larry to these handcuffs, and we're both standing like this and I was talking and I kept flailing my arm around and his arm was just kind of being pulled all over the place like this and then I took the key and it was a little lead key which is kind of funny and I undid his lock and broke the key on his handcuff and so he got free and he walked away and then my the key actually had literally broken off and I couldn't get the handcuff off my so I had to preach the whole rest of the sermon with this handcuff dangling on my hand the thought occurs to me though that sometimes as a peacekeeper which are the police or the military or whatever they'll go into a situation and they just want to maintain order you know stop the violence stop the crazy but the problem with just peacekeeping is they tend to avoid uh, conflict in the sense of totally making resolution. We should be careful here because I respect the police and I respect the military and it's a really good thing. However, peacekeepers are sometimes those that just avoid conflict. 
What's funny is, you know that phrase that said there's no I in team? There's no we in avoid either. There's no uh, reconciliation. There's no trying to make things better when we just avoid an issue or try to avoid something just to keep the peace. Here's another thing to write down. Peace makers, they embrace conflict in order to make peace. And I'm not, I don't mean you love conflict and you go after it and you're always like, you know, hands up and ready to box, but you embrace the idea of the end game of peace. You're ready to embrace something in order to find where peace comes from and make sure that reconciliation can happen. There's a third term that I didn't put on the notes or anything, but I thought of this morning is we are also not called to be peace breakers and just always be right and stomp out other people and make sure that they're wrong. We're not called to be peace breakers or just peacekeepers. Jesus calls us peace makers. And why does he do that? Is because he modeled that life of peace. As the Prince of Peace, he modeled a life and we model our lives after the Prince of of peace. If we're going to be called believers, if we're going to seek after this God, then we are going to model our lives after the Prince of Peace and be guided by the very things that uh, should direct us toward resolving conflict and making things better. For the last two weeks, I've used this phrase, uh, we are not just a God-believing home, but we are a Christ-centered home. Home. And to be Christ-centered means that you um, allow for there to be a place where we talk about peace and freedom and lack of conflict and learn as a family how to put Christ at the center of your lives. It's not very easy these days. It's very easy to have an emotional blowout, an emotional fight, and, you know, all kinds of things. And yet, God calls us to be peace Makers. A Christ centered home isn't necessarily even conflict free, but it's free from the extremes of super crazy conflict or the extremes of avoiding. So we're going to talk about that just a little bit. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 12 Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then he skips a verse. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you leave that on the screen for a minute, look at those words. Don't attack evil with evil. Don't go after the pain and the injustice and the hurt that happened in your life the same way that it happened. Again, I think of these 21 Christians that were murdered uh, overseas by this ISIS community that's trying to capture the world, not by peace, but by violence and by uh, fear and by all these things. And yet, if we, as Christians, act in that same way, everybody would just lose their head. Everybody would die. And where does it stop? Well, I know, pastor, but you got to see, we're a, we need to be a strong country. We need to prove that we're strong. We need to not just back down because other people attack Christians. And we need, I know, I mean, there's a lot of politics in the whole thing. However, for us in this town, the way we live in our communities, we cannot go beheading people just because we've been hurt or just because there's injustice. I'd love to talk to you further about that. I don't think this is the place for it up here on the platform. But I think God has called us to a place of peace. And when we act in a place of peace, then God's Holy Spirit can begin to work in somebody's life and there might be common resolution. I met a person this morning before the service in the meet and greet time and he said he works for the lamb ministry over here with people that are addicted to meth it's called Loved Ones Against Meth, and it's an idea of getting somebody out of their addiction. Here's the reason that's such a good ministry, is because it's somebody who's a peacemaker that walks into a situation saying, I love you, I want you to be free from your addiction, let me help you combat this addiction with you and walk you into freedom. And I said to him, I said, is it hard to do that ministry? It's got to be terribly hard to see a lot of people addicted to the things they are. And he goes, well, the, the good part about it is the freedom that some people find in being freed from this addiction. Because it's not about the meth. It's about what they're seeking underneath that. We had a little chat for a minute. And there is freedom in being a peacemaker 
when you go after the conflict, you can find where peace is. So you might be saying, well, how do I do that? It's so much easier to throw blows with somebody, to raise a fist and to say words back. And it's a lot easier, right? However, the hard part is being a peacemaker. Let me give you three little ideas of how to be a peacemaker today. These come out of different scriptures. How, do, how does a peacemaker function? How do you actually put some things in practice that you can function? Here's number one. You've heard this before. Speak the truth in love. Don't avoid the truth. And don't avoid speaking. And don't speak without truth or without love. A lot of people just speak hard, hard things. A lot of people hurt other people with words they say. You always do this. You're so lazy. You're always this. Or you never, ever come to my rescue. You never, right? So we always and we never people. And we end up hurting people along the way. Here's a little tip. Here's an idea of how to speak the truth in love. Don't speak if you're too emotional about it. Take the night off. Let the emotions calm down. Speak with somebody that you love in a matter that says, I love you, and I'd like to talk about this issue. However, I'm a little too emotional about this. I need just a couple hours. There are people that have called my office that want to talk to me and they're just on fire. They are ready to just solve the problems of the world or to put out the fire, you know, and I go, I'm actually busy. I can't talk to you until about tomorrow at three o'clock. Can you meet me tomorrow? And they're like, what? I have to talk to you right now. And I go, well, my only available time is tomorrow. And they're like, okay. And then by the time they come in the next day at three o'clock, they're like, oh, it's okay. It wasn't all that bad. Here's some ways that you can speak truth, but not in a hurtful manner, in a loving manner. You can say, I feel like you don't listen to me and that doesn't value who I am. If you could just listen to the words I say. Or you could say, I feel like when you're on your phone at dinner and I'd like to talk to you, you're putting your value or your attention somewhere else, right? These are pretty simple illustrations, but... um, I feel like maybe you don't notice when you do this, but when you make jabs at me in public with your friends, you you don't notice the jabs and that hurts me pretty bad. You can simply say things that are helpful things in love and not hurtful things. You could say, you know, when you speak about little lies and things that you do, I don't feel like I can trust you in small ways and I want to trust you in bigger ways. There's ways to communicate where we can love one another instead of hurt one another. So, okay, so number one is speaking the truth in love. Number two is this, apologize when you're wrong. The scripture comes out of 1 John chapter 1. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin... He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You've heard this before. In verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. That's a whole lot of words on the screen. Let me break it down into three simple verses and three simple thoughts. There's three ifs in this little passage. Number one is this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There are people you talk to that deny that they ever did anything wrong. This is denial. Well, I didn't sin. I didn't do anything wrong. I know somebody that is in the habit of taking money from people. And she goes, well, I don't do it. It's not really me. Well, there's three or four situations where she's taking money and there's, she's the common denominator and she's like, no, I, I didn't do it. Well, she's in denial. She's not believing that she's the one that did it. Number two is simply in this verse, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from unrighteousness. Does that mean that God won't forgive you if you don't confess? Be careful here because God has forgiven us The cross of Christ happened 2,000 years ago. Christ has forgiven us by the blood on the cross. However, if we confess our sin, we're submitting our will to God. We're saying, God, I believe that it's true. I'm the one that's in the wrong. You're the one who's right. Will you forgive my sin again? God says, I'll forgive you and purify you from things when you confess 
to me. It's not, a, it's not a if you don't confess, God won't forgive. It's when you confess, God says, I agree with you in your sin and I've forgiven you. And here's number three in the same little passage, verse 10. If we claim we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So now we're blaming God if we don't even agree that we sin at all. So God says, listen, you can deny that you sin, but you're still a sinner. You can blame me if you want to. However, if you confess, then this is when you apologize when you're wrong, this is when true peacemaking can happen. This is where peacemaking comes into play. We acknowledge there's a problem. We speak to the person in love. We ask for forgiveness or they ask for forgiveness. We confess a sin. There can be communication together. And simple confession is sometimes it's hard to do. Other times it's pretty easy. I shouldn't have raised my voice to you at dinner in the restaurant. I'm sorry I drew so much attention. I'm sorry that I said what I said. It was insensitive of me to correct you like that. I'm sorry I should have listened to your point a little bit farther. Another thought is, I shouldn't have thrown the cat off the roof. I'm sorry for doing that. was wrong. Here's what happens. When we're remorseful and we repent, then there's freedom. There's reconciliation if you own your part. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they haven't owned their part? And you can't for the life of you convince them that they've done something wrong? What do you do? Is it stalemate? Do you just sort of wait it out? It's hard you get to the place where you say, I want to be a peacemaker. I want to make this right. But you've got to own your part. So there's a relationship and going after it. I would say, don't just drop the ball, but go after it again. And if there's forgiveness in place, then we need to forgive. If there's grace, then grace. But if somebody won't own their part, there's a place where you can set some boundaries and say, we well, don't have a very good relationship right now because you're not owning this part. And it's super hard, isn't it? But this is where the scripture gets real. Here's number three. We need to forgive and grow. When we don't forgive people, we don't grow in our relationship with God. We don't grow in our relationship with other people. We don't grow in our own self-awareness. When we don't forgive other people of their hurt. And this is when you could say, well, pastor, you don't know my story. You don't know how bad this person has hurt me. You don't know that my spouse committed adultery and has broken my marriage. You don't know that this person has stolen from me and destroyed my trust. You don't know that my parents have abused me or I'm living with so much hurt and doubt and mistrust of God that I can't walk forward. I would love to just answer those questions for you, but you're right. I don't know. And it is very hard to live in that place of knowing we need to forgive, knowing we need healing, and we want freedom, and yet we're stuck in a place of credit. You hurt me, I want credit for that, right? As a believer, God calls us to a higher standard, even though it's difficult. I love this scripture in Colossians 3. Bear with each other and forgive one another as... Uh, if any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Where does shalom come from? It comes from forgiveness. Shalom and peace comes from this place of intentional grace, intentional work at forgiving. And if you just can't forgive, then ask the Lord for his peace. Ask the Lord that his grace be sufficient for you and work into that place. See, I believe that shalom can happen. I may be one of the few people in the world that actually believes God can heal situations. God can actually bring his healing and redemption plan and through his Holy Spirit reconcile people together. Let me tell you a story. When I was 11 years old, we lived in Canada and uh, we lived in this place. My dad was a teacher of aviation at the university up there in Abbotsford in BC. And I had two friends that lived on the same sort of street. I had a kid named Danny, and Danny and I were friends, and he lived about seven houses down from me. I lived at the corner, or I lived on this T, and he lived down at the end of the cul-de-sac. And Danny and I had a relationship where he had a bedroom that was facing mine, and I had a bedroom facing his, and we made up the little flashlight sort of talk at night, Morse code, and trying to figure things out at 11 years old, you know, like, 
how far does that go? And this was before really good flashlights. So we're like, what did you say? And we didn't have phones in any way. And then the next day at school, we talk about it. Danny was a good guy. Uh, there was another kid at the bottom of the hill. Uh, it's a funny metaphor, actually. Down at the bottom of the hill, and he lived in this place down by this farm, and his dad had all of these old cars and had a bunch of pornography magazines down in the basement. And Jimmy said, hey, come over to my house. Let's look at these magazines, and then let's go shoot BB guns at my dad's old cars and try to break mirrors and windows. Bad kid. That kid taught me what pornography was. He opened my eyes to that evil part of the world. Danny taught me what true friendship was. I had these two different friends, two totally different kinds of people, not not good down here and very good up here. And so uh, Jimmy one time, he said, hey, let's go to the little convenience store right over here and uh, let's go steal some candy. And I noticed that when I would play with Jimmy and I would do things with Jimmy, this adrenaline would flow in my soul. I would feel this like juice and adrenaline in my body, different than when I was friends with Danny. So I kind of wanted that. So Jimmy said, let's go steal something. So we went to this little store and we stole as many pieces of gum and candy and things as we could. And we get home. I didn't get caught until my dad noticed all this candy all over my dresser. He goes, hey, it's not October. How'd you get all that candy? Oh, Jimmy gave it to me. Well, he goes, well, Jimmy doesn't have any money. Oh, well, and my dad says, where'd you get the candy? I said, well, from the little store. And he goes, let's go for a walk. So we walk back to, the, he goes, oh, bring all your candy with you. So we walk back to the store. And my dad, who is a peacemaker, said to me, son, I'd like you to ask the store manager how much all that costs. And he put it all on the counter and he says about $14. And he goes, do you have $14? And I said, no. He said, well, then it's not yours. And he had me confess, give it back to change my heart. And I cried before him. But my dad, in his grace, showed me what it meant to be a peacemaker and to live in peace with people, not steal from people, not hurt other people, learn how to be forgiven learn how to forgive. I had to pay my dad back for just what I had done in breaking relationship with him. My dad had me sever ties with this kid, Jimmy. My dad had me grow stronger with my friend, Danny. All kinds of things happened when I was 11 years old. What happens in our lives when we don't address wrong? When we don't live for peace and, and it specifically attack brokenness. When we just hold back and keep secrets and pretend longer and longer, we're not a peacemaker. We don't make things right. And eventually the hurt will grow in our lives and we'll start to hurt other people, push people away, not receive other people in our lives. It's a dangerous game. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers those who go after the wrong. Why? Because God loves shalom. God wants all of us, as much as it depends on you, to make things right where you can. Obviously, there are some things that are out of our hands, things that we cannot grow and, and go address, like the 21 Christians in Libya. But there are ways we can pray. There are ways to ask God to help us reconcile. Let me finish by saying this. I love the verse because it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for then you will be called, what? Children of God. For us to become a child of God is to resemble his child, right? To become like Jesus, who was a peacemaker, who made things right. If we're going to be people of peace, we're going to be just like Jesus. I love some some devotions that I read this week that says those who respond to Jesus ministry are heirs of God's kingdom with him and they reflect the very character of God as they carry out Jesus mission in the world we have a mission to complete and we're never more like God than when we forgive other people we never act more like Jesus than when we forgive when we make peace with people. We've all agreed there's a lot of conflict in the world, right? We have a part to play in making things right and making peace for the world. Let's pray. God, we asked you to speak today. We prayed a prayer and asked for you to move, and I pray that you do. I pray now that you would remind each one of us individually where it is we need to make peace in our life. 
where it is we've been offended and where it is that we can specifically act in grace to speak the truth in love, to apologize if we're wrong, to ask for forgiveness or to forgive somebody else. God, you get to move now. You get to work in our lives and our hearts. Don't let us walk out of here and think about the weather and the ice and driving home and forget about the fact that we intentionally need to make peace with people. I pray that it starts with us right here in this church, individually, that we make peace with you and that, God, through that, you would make peace with other people around us in this church, in this town, in our workplace, in our marriage, in our, with our children. God, you get to do the work, and we ask for you to work hard. Don't let us give up. Let us work and walk with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. I can't get the idea of glue out of my head. Not because I ate a lot of glue when I was a little kid, or not because when you play with glue, there's different kinds of glue, right? There's glue sticks, there's liquid glue, there's uh, rubber cement, it's all goopy in a jar, there's all kinds of glue. What's the craziest glue out there? Crazy glue. Have you ever stuck your fingers together and you tear your fingerprints off and that kind of thing? I think God calls us to be like glue for people to draw people together in the right and appropriate times and places in relationships of peace. Not so much so that you tear each other apart when you have to like wash your hands and not so much so that you eat a bunch of glue sticks and things like that, but there's a balance in between this peacemaking, right? Don't make peace with things that are not of God. Don't make peace with things that are not good for your soul, with the jimmies of your life. Make peace with the places where God can work, and God can show up, and Jesus' light actually shows up in relationships, and people ask you, why do you have so much peace? Well, because I believe in a God who's greater than my circumstances and my problems. My prayer is that we seek after peace and we become peacemakers. Amen? We receive today's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you what? His peace, both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go with God.